AI, two letters filled with dreams. What do you think when you think of AI? Robots, futuristic, science fiction. Artificial intelligence is the science behind creating and making these intelligent machines. Happy birthday, AI. This is 60 years. 60 years since the original conference in Dartmouth College where more than 10 to 15 scientists met together for the birth of AI. And two of them are in fact even from here, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon. Their goal was to build a computer with human capability. And they were even really optimistic because from their description, it will be solved in 20 years. Like hmm. So we are 60 years later, and still we've not solved it. But there's been a lot of amazing achievement in the last 60 years. The first one started with Alan and Herbert working on this our first program, AI program called the Logic Tourist, to try to mimic human capabilities. And since then, we've seen many examples from Watson were playing Jeopardy to more recently AlphaGo, two months ago, even less than two months ago, winning again the world champion of this really challenging game. These are great examples of reasoning and learning, a capability of human intelligence really important. But as we know, we are, our human intelligence is more than that. When we are, we are also social intelligence. Social intelligence is what early on makes it possible, is part of our development. This is how we express our joy, our sadness, or our surprise. The social intelligence is how also we communicate uh, when we see a mother and her child, or as we see later, the lovers are part of uh, community. Social intelligence, how do we express this? A lot of these social and emotional signals are expressed through the three V of communication. Verbal, vocal, and visual. The verbal aspect is which word do I decide to say? Which word I decide to emphasize when I talk about failure or about happiness? The second one is vocal. How do I emphasize each word? I can say, OK, OK, OK. All of these are the same word, but they mean really different things. And finally, the visual. Your gesture, your hand gestures, your uh, even fidgeting that you see in the legs, or the facial expression. These are all these multimodal behavior by which we express our social or emotional signals. So. As a vision of AI, we want to address social intelligence. But my vision of AI goes a step further, where also we want to create machines that are supportive of human interaction in your daily life. And if you ask me, what's in my heart is the most exciting is also helping with medical domain in healthcare, where we have doctors who have this challenging uh, case of assessing uh, mental disorders like depression, anxiety, and PTSD. These are measures, these are disorders that comes often with subjective behaviors, emotions. And so it's really hard to, to look at them objectively. But this is not just for medical. This is also a challenge for education, where we're looking at uh, children working together, or these days looking also at online learning, working, people working together remotely. These are examples also in the work environment. And this vision of social and supportive AI is this challenge of going from verbal, visual, and vocal to be able to infer social and emotional signals that are helpful for healthcare, medical, uh, and uh, education as well. So that's a big thing. How do you address that? What's really exciting is this is the right time to work on this topic. There's been a lot of really exciting developments in these last 
uh, 10 to 15 years, where we go from shallow interpretation to much deeper interpretation. We go from shallow interpretation of the facial landmark, where we can sense where, where each of the eye corner and eyebrows are moving, to a point where you look at muscle of the face, and to the point where you go to the next stage, which really interests us, facial expression. And this is just one modality. These mo this is also true for verbal, where we can, from your word, infer the topic or the sentiment, or from your voice, look at your emotion. The second aspect that's interesting in this is now it is multidisciplinary. We're looking at it as a human communication dynamics. What is human communication dynamics? At the micro level, we look at one behavior, a smile. A smile, it has a dynamic to it. And you know this because you've seen politician. A politician smile is different from a real emotion, a happy smile, which is different. Or maybe some politicians smile different also than others, but we're not going to get on this topic. But the smile in itself is really important. The second aspect is my gesture all goes together. So it's a smile, it's my voice, it's the word. This is the multimodal aspect. But this is just one person. We're here. We're social. So we should not just look at one person, but at the dyadic or the interpersonal between people. My behavior affects your behaviors. This is the same way that we see in synchrony, and this is the same thing we see in a patient, in a doctor, or in a group. But all these are interesting when I look also at the social dynamic, because we are different. We are different culture, and with each of them, we have different dynamics of communication. And what is the final key to this is the internet. And my students love watching YouTube, but they do it for work. They do it because now we have this humongous uh, example of how people are expressing themselves and communicating. And we can use this with something that was invented early on, almost 40 years ago, which is the idea of neural networks. This is the fourth generation of neural networks. And when we mix it with the big uh, data that we have now, we can start looking at the same problem, but uh, now we can address it with the multimodal deep learning. What does it mean? You may have heard deep learning because AlphaGo was based on deep learning. Deep learning, what it gives us in this case, is a way to bring everything together. The words, verbal, the vocal, and the visual. We have now a way of bringing all of these together so that if I hear I like it, or if you see me smiling, you can see that they are similar. At the same time, if you see me depressed, or if you hear my tone of voice, this is another factor that are similar, and the same for uh, surprise. And so let me give you some concrete example of how multimodal perception, thank you very much. Oh, OK. The multimodal perception can go and, and help with healthcare, education, and, and the uh, the, the business. And so in healthcare, we would like to help with depression, with PTSD, or with uh, schizophrenia. And we want to give them tools, and this is multisense, a tool that allows you to analyze automatically the behavior of the patient as they interact with their doctor. And why is it interesting? It's because now we have an objective tool to look at what is usually really subjective. And what did we find through this? If we think of depression, we have a lot of intuition about how a depressed person will behave. You will think that smile. People who are depressed will smile less often. This is not true. People who are depressed are smiling as often as non-depressed. But their smiles are shorter and less amplitude. It is because probably because of social norm, you feel that you need to smile because someone else smiles, or there's a pause, but really you don't feel it, so you change the dynamic of it. The second example is for stress, where you expect that people who are stressed or over trauma will in fact have more negative facial expression. But in fact, you don't see a difference when you look overall. But if you split men and women, 
you see an opposite trend. Really interesting. Men with stress or PTSD are in more negative facial expression. Women shows less. Now you will tell me, is it because this study was done in Los Angeles? Maybe. Uh, but really it is bringing some really interesting research question about the behaviors and the difference between gender. And the last example is in schizophrenia, where we look at unusual thoughts. And there, if you look at facial motion or eye gestures, in this case, when they are with the doctors, there's no difference. They behave as normal population. But you look at them by themselves, in their room, and then you see a big difference in the way they behave. And these are examples how technology in multimodal perception can help doctors to help with the diagnosis and the treatment of these behaviors. And I'm going to say this can go a step further. One more thing. Uh, a step further where we can now build technology like a virtual interviewer, a virtual character who is not there to replace the doctor, but gives you a tool to interview the patient and look at their behaviors. So I'm going to show and introduce Ellie, who is an automatic virtual human and is able to interact with the patient. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good. Where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm from LA myself. <laughs> when was the last time you felt really happy? Um, but I try to stay happy. Um, I, I'd rather be happy. Uh, my kids keep me going. What advice would you have given yourself 10 or 20 years ago? Um, to, uh, to not believe, uh, to, to, to not be so gullible, to not be so gullible. So this is an example of social and supportive AI. What we have here is a visual interviewer and multi-sense technology that analyze your verbal, vocal, and visual behaviors. And you wonder, why a virtual interviewer? The idea of virtual interviewer is if you look at the response of a patient, you want to standardize the stimuli. So by having a standardized virtual interviewer, you are sure that we're looking at the same kind of response. But the other advantage, which we did not expect, is that people originally were supposed to interact 15, 20 minutes. They ended up interacting with Ellie 30 to 40 minutes. There was something about talking with the virtual interviewer that was comforting, no judgment. And if you look at their behavior, people who interacted with the virtual human, and we tell them, there's nobody, this is fully automatic. Compared to the people, we tell them, hey, this is an avatar, there's a human behind it pressing the buttons. The people who believe that it's fully automatic were in fact showing more sadness. You see in their facial expression, they were, you can see the confidence. They can talk to this person. This is just one example. And there's a lot of interesting questions coming out of this research, ethical questions about how to move forward. But we can see a lot of advantage. We learn things about how people are behaving and now creating technology that can help doctors, educators, and business. So thank you very much for your attention.